at Lincoln Center, it's the Merv Griffin Show. Thank you, you're very kind. And I have, I want to start off the show, they just told me backstage, I'm so excited I could burst. In honor of the Merv Griffin Show being here at Lincoln Center at the Vivian Beaumont Theater, the uh, Lincoln Center has just announced that all this week, Zubin Mehta and the New York Philharmonic will be performing I've Got a Lovely Bunch of Coconuts in C minor. Late. I just saw some kid up there said, what are you talking about? I don't know how fast they forget. Well, today I am pleased to announce to all of you, seriously, folks, Broadway comes to Lincoln Center and the Vivian Beaumont Theater. You are in for an incredible show today with all of your favorite music. No living performer has symbolized the excitement of the Broadway musical more than this lady who is our special guest today. The list of songs she has introduced is staggering. And her appearance anywhere is a big event. And the event we're bringing you today is the one and only Ethel Merman. <laughs> so if any of you are wearing contact lenses, take them out now, because she, <laughs> she'll crack every glass in the place. We just open the doors. We don't turn on a microphone when she's here. After starting her career in New York, this next talented guest went to Hollywood. She made it big in films and in television with her own series. She's back for a while in New York, but starring in the musical they're playing our song. A performer with great style, Stucker Channing. You see it all. The other thing we love about New York is the opportunity. When my show was here uh, in the middle 60s for a long time, one of the great joys we had on that show was to be able to find new comedians. And as you know, many of them made their first and many appearances with us. Uh, first show I ever did introduced Richard Pryor, George Carlin, Lily Tomlin. Uh, the list just goes on and on and on. And today we're going to present to you a brand new comedian who is really going to tickle your fancies if your fancies need tickling right there. <laughs> Bob Nelson will be joining us today. Now, the exciting event that's going to occur on this show today is when Oklahoma meets the west side of New York right here on this stage. First of all, in 1943, uh, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II collaborated on their first Broadway musical. As you know, it's now the legendary masterpiece, Oklahoma. And proving that something of quality stands the test of time, over 35 years later, Oklahoma is once again a Broadway smash. And I'm pleased to say that the stars of that special Pulitzer Prize winning show have come over from the Palace Theater today to entertain all of you with the music from that show. The young cast of Oklahoma will be joining us here. But first of all, let's start it all right here in New York. Speaking of revivals, the New York street gangs, the Sharks, and the Jets are at it again. This time at the Miskoff Theater, where the stunning musical West Side Story is uh, standing room only. And once again, the production is in the hands of the brilliant Jerome Robbins. Joining us right this minute from West Side Story will be the young couple who play Tony and Maria. First, you'll meet Ken Marshall and then Josie de Guzman. First, here's Ken Marshall. Soon as it shows, 
that make them cannonball in dust with the sky gleam in its eye, bright as a rose. Who knows? It's only just out of reach, down the block, on a beach, under a tree. I got a feeling there's a miracle do, gonna come true, come into me.
Ken Marshall, the young stars of West Side Story at the Menskoff Theatre. We'll come right back with them after this message. Plunkett Furniture invites you to browse through the world of fine quality home furnishings during our spectacular anniversary sale. Plunkett's is offering savings to 20%, even on our fabulous Drexel Heritage collections. Marvelous values free delivery, professional designing, and integrity are just a few reasons why Plunkett Furniture is the source for today's lifestyles. Discover Plunkett's with five convenient locations, the family who has been making houses into homes for nearly a half century. Tonight on MASH, Frank gets a medal. Sir, may I have the medal, please? Frank, here is your purple earring. <laughs> Then it's the Benny Hill Show. <laughs> MASH at 10, the Benny Hill Show at 10.30, tonight on Channel 32. You cannot tell me that you're not in love after doing that every single day, huh? Well, we're pretty fond of each other. Yeah. Cause, oh. Hey, we're in love. See how I find things out? Because we all stood backstage there and watched. And when the lips met, and that yeah. song, we were all going, oh, oh. <laughs> is that all it is, Ken? Oh. Plus, there's somebody else in your life, isn't there? Aren't you yes. married? Oh, yes, yeah. Aha. <laughs> She's out there. I better watch what That's I say. Two bits of gossip I found out here right now. <laughs> and is uh, Mrs. Marshall often at the theater? Oh, yeah, she, uh, I guess she's seen it about a dozen times now. But uh, she's given it a rest for a while now. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet. Does she kid you about your romantic scenes? Oh, she, she used to. I think she's gotten used to it now. I mean, right. she and Josie are good friends, yeah. so. Well, they has to be that way. Well, I have to deal with Josie's boyfriend, too, you know, so. Oh, oh. Josie, yours is an interesting uh, past. You were born here. Right. And then you moved to Puerto Rico. Right. I was, I was raised in Puerto Rico. So I had, I had like best of both worlds, you know, I've had a taste of Puerto Rico and I've that. had a taste of New York. And uh, I, what I business is your dad in? Uh, he's a psychoanalyst. <laughs> That's why well, I'm he'll so come crazy, in handy right? with this, I'll tell you. <laughs> really? You ain't kidding. <laughs> That's why I'm crazy. <laughs> and your wife is? Uh... She's an editor and she just got accepted to law school, so maybe she'll go to law school. I don't know. Isn't that interesting? Good, Jim. It must be very difficult, m most of all, doing a revival, because you have, you're part of a revival that was in our time. I mean, the, the original opened in what year? 1957. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, what, 13 years? Uh, oh, my word, it's not. It's 23 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? Well, I saw it when I was a little kid, and I just thought, <laughs> see how fast they turn on you on a talk show? But everybody remembers, so it must be twice as tough doing a show that everybody remembers every little bit of it. Well, yeah, there's a... You know, when a show's been such a success like West Side was, it almost becomes myth in a sense. So, yeah, to be well-received, I think you have to be at least as good, if not better. Right. Yeah, I think so. And like Oklahoma, your opening night made great national news. I guess it was filled with celebrities. And, oh, it was a ball, yeah. And there's so many celebrities associated with it in the first place, with uh, Sondheim and... 
Leonard Bernstein and mm -hmm. Jerome Robbins. And yeah. I have this picture Peter that I really James. cherish of uh, Lauren Bacall standing there with the guy who plays Bernardo and myself. She's giving us a big hug and everything. Isn't that nice? Yeah, and Burt Reynolds was there the other night. Oh. Rock Hudson, all these unbelievable stars. It's My <laughs> word. Liv Ullman. <laughs> you just stand there and watch. And That's great. exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. In a show, though, that, uh, that is so energetic and fighting and guns and frightening things that happen. Do things always go perfectly? Oh, no. Uh, I had an incident where my, at the end, I'm, I'm pointing at, at um, all the people on stage and my- The gun scene. Right, the gun scene at the end where Maria is a little crazed. And <laughs> I shot a jet because I, I pulled, I mean, I was, I just like touched the trigger and it went off. It <gasps> suddenly went off. And, uh, what did jet, the jet do? The jet just kind of like looked at me and didn't know whether, for a second there, he didn't know whether to die or not. And he just like... I, mean, I would have yelled, you missed! Right? <laughs> no, he, he didn't, didn't die, did and he? Then he? No, he did. Yeah. He slowly died, and he slowly like <laughs> melted into the ground. And the guy next to him decided he should die, too. <laughs> yeah. so Two guys died? Oh, yeah. And then like the second guy decided he wasn't dead, so I, he got up. I did oh. you know? <laughs> Dead there. How I got a you know? word of mouth from yeah. the rest of the But what and happened when he was supposed so to come people back? People were being dragged off stage, you know. Meanwhile, right. I'm asking for help. And uh, I had a friend who came up to me after the show and says, no sympathy for you, Maria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. But did the guy show up at the end of the show, even though he was shot in the first? Oh, you mean for the curtain call? Uh, in, in, this in, is at the end of the he show. Was, that he was hurt, to. though. That was, that was very scary because um, we use blanks. And right. they do... They do hurt you if you're close, and I, I thought I had really hurt him bad, but mm. he just got, like, his neck got hurt. Swollen, right. <laughs> well, it's a fun show to be on stage. Uh, yeah. I thank you both very oh, much. Josie de Guzman, Ken Marshall, continued success. You're wonderful. It was a great pleasure to have you here. We'll take a break and come back with Ethel Merman. If you or someone you love is age 55 to 87, I urge you to get pencil and paper ready to respond to this announcement. Now, even though you are age 55 to 87, you can buy life insurance with no physical examination and no medical questions. You cannot be turned down or charged higher rates because the Colonial Pen Life Insurance Company guarantees your premium to be $6.95 a month. This is the life insurance policy that guarantees your acceptance regardless of your health. So if you are between 55 and 87 and thought it would be difficult to buy life insurance, shouldn't you call right now for free information in the mail? No salesman will call on you. This offer ends soon, so call now. For free information in the mail, call 800-648-5322. The call is free. 800-648-5322. Old-fashioned country-style bacon. It's priced at only 59 cents a pound. Sizzle some up today from Dominic's. How in the world this has to work at all? It's just a prop, folks. Are you ready? Open the doors. She's about to come out here. Only one, there's only one, like the woman I'm about to present, the greatest entertainer, entertainer Broadway has ever produced. Ladies and gentlemen, here to sing for you is the incomparable Ethel Merman. the time of my life learning to enjoy at my leisure all the simple pleasures and so I happily conceive this is all I ask this is all I Good-looking men walk a little slower, 
when you walk by me. Lingering sunsets stay a little longer with the lonely sea. Children everywhere when you shoot at mad men, shoot at me. understand wandering rainbows leave a little color for my heart to own stars in the sky make my wish come true before the night has Come back and talk to Ethel right after this message. See, that was the biggest surprise in the world for me to hear you sing that gorgeous song. In a lovely song. Which Gordon Jenkins, I guess, wrote for Frank Sinatra. I've never heard a girl sing it. Really? Because the opening line is beautiful girl. So you threw in I a little... I couldn't very well say that. No. Walk a little slower when you walk by me. Right. Not me being married for it. <laughs> See, and I didn't even ask, <laughs> folks, right? <laughs> That's no. amazing. I've never heard a girl sing that before. Really? Do you know the origin of that song? No. That was written in New York City in honor of construction workers. Construction workers? Yep. I hear them. And now that spring is here in New York, I thought it was the birds outside my window. It's all the construction workers whistling, right, at girls. He was walking down the street, and they were doing a building. Yeah. And he heard construction worlds, girl, uh, workers saying to girls, Hey! Beautiful girl, walk a little slower when you walk by me. How about and that? And went right to a piano and wrote that song. Well, he certainly did a good job. He it's a sure did. I think it's one of the best things he's ever written. Do you ever walk by guys and say, hey, good looking guy, walk a little slower when Not you... construction work, is no, it? No, no. <laughs> you wouldn't mind a construction worker, No, they're though? pretty rugged looking. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're nice. Yeah, with the helmets and everything. You've never yeah. cared about the position in life that one of those six husbands has had, have you? Four. Oh, four, I mean, four. 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 You no. never worried about them, be, whether they were a plumber, a baker, a candlestick? No, no, but they, a couple of them worried about me, whether I was up there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, did they? <laughs> oh, yes, my dear. Think you'll ever do it again, Ethel? Are you kidding? Huh? No, I've said this before to you. I you know, know why, but I don't why, believe you, why, that's why. Buy the cow and you can get the milk for free. That's you know? right. Sure. Sure. I couldn't be bothered. I really? just, I couldn't be bothered having someone around me all day long and then tell me what to do. I'm, I, I have such a wonderful life now. I love my independence. I come and go as I please. You ever lonesome? I go out without, no. Huh? No, as a matter of fact, uh, when I'm, when I'm home, because I live right here in New York, New England, and when I'm home, I sort of relish the, the, the fact that sometimes I go to bed, if I'm home alone, I go to bed sometimes at 7.30, 8 o'clock, watch television, and have a wonderful night's sleep, and, and it's great. Yes. You got a hot tub? You don't tub? believe me, do you? 
<laughs> See, if you were living in California, you'd have a hot tub. I got a hot tub and a cold shower. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, I worry about you, Ethel. Oh, I mean, don't worry about me. But you led a kind of nice, raucous life along with your uh, yeah. great public uh, image. Yeah, sure. It just seems that but the town's quieted down when Ethel Merman quiets down. Well, I don't, I live a, really, you don't I, knit, live a, do I, you? Think I lead a very low-key life. I just go out, you know, with my friends to dinner or something like that. Yeah. There's nothing very great that I that I do. You know, I don't go all these parties and these April and Paris balls and somebody has a hangnail and they throw a big ball or something yeah. at the PA. The, I don't the know. hangnail ball you is know, very sure, big in New York. Know, but, but, <laughs> I don't I don't I don't go to those functions. I don't like crowds. I like to be like maybe about six of my friends or eight of my friends, and that's tops. I don't like cocktail parties where you stand around and you're you're tired. You I know. know what you do. You sing around the house. I don't. I never, I never open my throat from one engagement to another. The last time... You don't go, me, he, me, he, me, he, me, he, me, he, me, he, me. No, 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 no. The last time I sang, my word of honor, was March the 27th. We did a show at the Ed Sullivan Theater for a home box office, a show called Showstoppers. Yeah. And that's the last time I sang. Now I won't open my throat again till I go. I go to Canton, Ohio, with the symphony. You go to Monaco, and then and then Richmond, Virginia, and then to Monaco for a TV special in Monaco. We go. Would well, you know that place okay. backwards? Huh? Done four shows there. Yep. You're never going to have a time like that, and you're going to be working for Marty Pacetta. Yep. On yep. the big Monaco show from yes, the, sporting the Sporting Club. club. Wait till you get a load of that. The closest I've got. You won't be so going far. to bed at 7:30 with a television. No. Mm -mm -mm. Well, I don't know. Mm -mm. I guess in Nice they're nice, huh? I mean, in Nice they are nice, right? <laughs> and yeah. you must go to Cannes, too. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, see, I'm not the kind of this. I have to get to up the with south this of stuff. France. Oh, yes. Right. I, yeah. I've never been there. I've been all through Europe now. I've been in here all over. Does it ever bother you, Ethel? I mean, you go to see shows now. Sure. And I understand the problem, but in the last two shows I have seen, everybody's got a microphone pinned to their chest and there are giant microphones coming out of the footlights yeah i mean they've well, shut them off when you appear don't they uh, well when i did shows i mean we just had them uh, when i first did shows there were no microphones at all you had and a then, horn and then eventually no and then eventually they put the microphones down on the foots where they or where the foots like let's be but you know why i think they do it now because i think all the music is orchestrated heavier the well, band is I asked Ken Marshall heavier. from West Side Story, I said, Ken, why all of the microphones? He said, because music has changed, and in the orchestras, they're using a lot of amplified That's instruments. That's right. You and see? in order to sing over That's it, right. you got to do it. Well, like, for instance, in concert, when I work with the Philharmonics and the symphonies, I have to wear a chest mic because, uh, like, 90 musicians behind me, the, the, each section, the violin section, the viola section, that's all mic'd. Yeah. And I, I have to. I just but I mean, to. like, let me give you an example for right now. Now, see the, the size of this auditorium? Yeah. Watch me, just turn off the microphones, watch me hit a high note. <laughs> you hear? Hit a high note. You, hit a high note. Yeah, I did, yeah oh. but there's no band behind you. No. See? Plus, there's I no didn't music hit a, behind you. I didn't hit a high note. And, uh, mm -hmm. Were you in vaudeville? Uh, I played, uh, before I went into Girl Crazy, I played the Palace. When the yeah. palace was two a day, as a matter of fact, I uh, played there for two weeks, and I used to go from the palace to up to the Alvin Theater to re to rehearse Girl Crazy with Ginger Rogers and, and Willie and Eugene Howard, and yes. Yeah. At what moment in your musical career, your Broadway career, Ethel, did you know you were a star? When Buddy De Silva put my name over the title. <laughs> was that it? In Panama Hattie, I had always been like under the, it was like the show, and then with so and so and so and so. But he was the first one to star me in a Broadway show. It was Ethel Merman in Panama Hattie. And then I knew I had arrived. Matter of fact, I took a picture of him. Did, did for example, show. when you first worked for the Gershwins, did they tell you prior to opening night you will be made in uh, the show? George Gershwin told me. As a matter of fact, during rehearsals, he was the one who told me never to go near a, um, a singing teacher. And I never have. Never in my life have I ever had a singing lesson. It's a little late to start now, but I mean, uh, I've never gone. So one. from engagement to engagement, you don't even open your mouth? Never. You walk in the first no, day? No, no, I have How do you know it's there? Well, the man up there is with me. It's always there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have a theory that if you, you know, you vocalize a lot, by the time you get out of the stage, you're tired. The throat's tired. Yeah. That's my opinion. I don't know. Who knows? Hey. But I. This is all off the cuff. 
we did not talk before the show, let me sing a duet with you. Let me do Russell Knipe and Call Me Madam. Well, of course. Mort? I've heard about it. This is the first I've heard of it. E flat, Mort. Is that your key of I don't know. We'll see how it comes out. Did you do first verse? One of her best moments. I hear music and there's no one there. I hear laughing. The trees? The trees are bare. All day long I seem to walk on air. I wonder why. I wonder why. I keep talking in my sleep at night. And what's more, I've lost my appetite. Stars that used to twinkle in my eyes are twinkling in your eyes. I wonder why. You don't need analyzing. It is not so surprising that you feel very strange. But nights, I love it. Your heart goes in a patter. I know just what's the matter Because I've been there once or twice, twice oh, God. Put your head on my shoulder You need someone who's older A rub down with a velvet glove There is nothing you can take To relieve that pleasant ache You're not sick, you're just in love You don't need But the trees are bare. Your heart goes in a long I see the water. I know just what's the matter. I wonder why. Because I've been there I once or twice. Come here, put your head on my shoulder. In my sleep at night. And what's more, I've lost my appetite. There is nothing that used to twinkle in your eyes are twinkling. That is yeah. fun. <laughs> that's, that's fun, yes. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that fun? <laughs> you have no idea what that's like. My ears are still ringing. It was so exciting. And so are mine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've never sung with you thrill. before either. Thanks. Once before we did that. We did? Yeah, oh, we did that. Oh, at the that. Hollywood, that's right. Yeah, once yeah, we did Yeah, I remember that. Quite yeah. a while ago, though. John Philip Sousa led the band. It yeah. was <laughs> Yeah, and we sang over them. Yeah. And then couldn't hear the band. Ethel, yeah. as always, I love Thank being you. I, I anywhere love, with you. You're I love doing your show. You're a great lady and a great gifted performer. Well, you're a wonderful Our host, best. and it's nice to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Thank you. Ethel Merman, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back. I love it. Ethel's representative met her backstage said, Ethel, you have an hour before the dinner. Ethel said, well, I'm going back on a show then. <laughs> sure. Come on, sit here and enjoy it. So we drag her. Come on, Ethel. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Sure. You want to sit around downstairs for an no, hour? You'll be singing sure. in the dressing no, room. Sure. Right? right, all by myself in the morning. I want you to meet this young. I don't know if you've ever met her in person before. I admire her. Oh, she is I dynamite. She's, she's taking a short break from her CBS yes. series, The uh, Stockard Channing Show, mm -hmm. but it will be back on the air next season. She's co-starring in the hit Broadway musical, They're Playing Our Song, and she's a delightful young lady. Here's Stockard Channing. <laughs> Where's your horse? <laughs> and may I ask what all the hares are doing all over you? Oh, gosh, I tipped it. I have a furry friend with me today. Yeah, not a I bear. Or a, a bear, yes. A whole bear? A bear. You it's wouldn't... a little bear. It's a bear. You wouldn't I, I don't go anywhere bear without to... my bear. <laughs> no, I, it's my dog. I got yeah. my dog. She goes everywhere with me, so. Oh, that's, is she back there? Yes, would you like to meet my dog? Yeah, you want to see? Oh, Wait a minute, wait. Brown dog. Oh, okay. 
Look at this. Here we are. Hey. No, no. Hey, here. Here. Here, no, here, here she is up here. here. See, she hears you on speakers all over the place. Here's Mama. Up here. Here we go. Good. Look. What a great dog. Yeah. Oh. Well, is it your flight in from L.A.? Oh, yeah. 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 Very. But you had to bring her. You've had nothing but disaster in New York. Oh. I mean, in L.A. Too. Yes. We finished taping uh, the television show on a Friday. Yep. And Saturday, I'm packing my suitcases to go to New York for three months, you know, which in itself is very traumatic since, you know, the rains are coming down. And my husband goes out to get a log for the fire. And he comes running back into the house and saying, the hill is coming down. The hill is coming oh, down. I said, stop that. No. And I, I said, no, no, no. I said, make a phone call. How do we know? We're from New York. I don't know about hills coming down. You know what I mean? Right. Things like that are acts of God. I mean, in New York, maybe you'll get mugged. Those are acts of man. But in L.A., it's acts of God. Constantly. And blood and fire and whatever. So they called, uh, so my husband called uh, the people he's supposed to call. And they said, the tell us what's happening. And he told them, he said, get out of there. So we grabbed the dog and the cat, and we had to evacuate our house. And the car got washed away. It was totally incredible. Stucker. And you just bought that house or just moved in, hadn't you? No, we would had the house a couple of years, but we'd done a lot of work to it. That was it. <laughs> it was, you know, it's a very strange feeling. I felt did like it I was in a Did it stay or did wheel. it go? You know, it stayed. It was fine. It had some damage to it because the hill sort of slid around and came out right. You're not on one of those jobs I see in uh, Coldwater Canyon or... No, not oh, they're stilts. on stilts. Oh, oh those oh. things no. are scary. Yeah. Now, this is fairly, he's wedged in against a hill. Right. Then I got on a plane the next day, on Sunday. I came into New York. I started rehearsals on Monday. So Monday night, I said, oh, I'm going to take a little breather. I went and, and uh, met a friend of mine for dinner, and my bag was stolen with all my credit cards, all my money, all identification. I'm carrying a passport around with me now because I have no identification. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it was just, I said, well, nothing else could happen, you know? Well, you got such wonderful notices that everything's uphill now, isn't it? Well, that's all that really matters to an actor anyway, is how the show is doing, I think, you know? It really kind of makes you realize that the rest of the stuff is, it comes and it goes, but it's the work and... When you're as famous as you are from television and from films, and you come into a show like they're playing our song, you don't have to audition. No, I was, I was lucky. I'm, I was awful, awful, lousy auditioner. I'm, I'm scared to just foul the whole thing up. Horrible auditioner. Can't audition. Very bad, yeah. very bad. And uh, so I was very lucky that I got a little toehold because I don't have to do that very much anymore. What's the best audition you've ever given? If all I, of them were so lousy. I don't know. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I remember, the younger you are, I think the easier you are to just go out there and, and sell. I remember when I was my first real job, I was in Boston, and uh, it was for a man called David Wheeler for the theater company in Boston. And I wanted to do a scene from the importance of being earnest, and I stood up and did both parts in the tea party scene. And I, I would talk to myself this way, and I got up and went to the other side, and I went like that. And I thought he, he thought I was so crazy that he gave me the job because I really didn't know what an audition was. And so I just re I memorized the whole scene and did it for him. And it was pretty good. It was pretty funny because it was very unselfconscious. Did you ever audition for movies? Oh yes, yes. Uh, the uh, I probably the, uh, the the best story about that is for the fortune because. Um, it was the first uh, big part I ever had. I had like two days here, you know, it was cut out and stuff like that, and like three movies. And anyway, so I was uh, in Los Angeles, and my agent said, there's a script that with Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson, and Mike Nichols is going to direct it, and it's Not this wonderful weird. part, and you know, you'd be terrific, and he's going to start auditioning people and reading people. So I went in and I met Mike Nichols, and, and uh, he was very nice. And I was a little tongue-tied, and he said, listen, tomorrow morning, which was a Saturday, uh, Warren and Jack are coming over and they're going to read through the script uh, and they'd like someone to play the girl to hear how it sounds for the writer, would you like to do it? I said, sure, well, can I read the script? He said, no, it's like a cold reading. So the next day I got up and I happened to be staying in the same hotel that the writer was staying in and I, came, I got in the elevator. I mean, there was a phone call, so we're ready for you now. And I thought I was going to be executed, you know? And I got downstairs and I walked into this room, I sat down and there's Mike Nichols, which in itself was enough because I'd never met a famous person before in my life. And he was very gracious. And the door opens, and in comes Jack Nicholson wearing dark glasses and a mink-lined Levi jacket. Now, I mean, I'm a girl from New York, you know what I mean? And, I, and I'm sitting there looking like I'm from Kelly Girl, first of all, because that's the way I used to dress. Right. Little plaid skirt, you know, going, hello, Mr. Nicholson, how are you? You know? <laughs> and I'm just like this, and he's got the shades on, you know, and it's real to paint, hey, you know, no. balaboo-boo. And then in comes Warren Beatty with black velvet 
you know, jeans up to his neck or something, and also dark glasses, and, and wear this little Eisenhower jacket. And I and he sits down on the couch next to me, and I practically fell off the couch. Right. So I mean, he's and they're chatting away, and so I, I excuse myself, and I went into the bathroom, and I turned around three times. I didn't have to go to the bathroom. I just I had to get out of there and make a fresh start. And I came back in. Good. I still hadn't opened my mouth, right? So we start reading the script, and. There's about 10 minutes, and they're like batting it back and forth. They're a little sleepy, you know. And I read the script, and it says, Freddie, which is the name of my character, enters crying hysterically. <laughs> and they're like just being real laid back and not acting at all. And I said, this is the one chance I've got, right? right. And it's like Andrew laughing. And like from nowhere, it's like doing a, a broad jump from a standing position. And I opened my mouth, and I entered crying hysterically. And I thought Warren Beatty was going to jump 10 feet off the couch. Yeah. Just went to my, Jesus, what, the, what is this next to me on the couch? How, how big did you do it? I mean, I, I, I mean, was it, you know, oh, what was I? Was it, um, I remember one phrase. It was like, um, uh, I can't, God, I can't remember the words. It was like, you know, I will never speak to him again. It was like that big, <laughs> you know, and, and he looked like this. And then Jack started... He like picked it up and he started acting a bit. The next thing, it was four hours later, and we read through the whole script. I still hadn't opened my mouth, and then uh, Warren said to Jack, "You know, Stockard, is that your, is your name? What's your name? Stockard? Stockard? Interesting name." He said, uh, "Stockard's uh, pretty good in the part. It's gonna be very difficult to hear anybody else in the part." And I said, "That's the general idea." Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, "Where do you come from?" I said, "The fourth floor." And I got in the elevator and I be went back up to the fourth and floor. And got the part. <laughs> and four and a half months later, oh, I got a call for the uh, screen test. You can't be timid, can you? No, you bet you can't. I mean, you have to so walk. Hard. You never had to audition, did you? Uh, no, I didn't. They, they heard me singing at the Brooklyn Paramount. That's how I get cast for Girl Crazy. Right. They probably heard you in Manhattan from That's the right. Department. That's right. And all the windows were sealed tight. Really? Yep. Gee. Right through the windows. Yep. That's a horrendous experience. Thank because. You. It, in, in some ways it's cruel, but in some ways it's a great test of the stamina and the presence yeah. of a performer. Because I used to come to every audition on Broadway, and you always had your rhythm tune. What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in. Yeah, it's almost like being. And then, then you'd pick for your ballad the song of the day. Yeah. Which in my day was uh, Pinza's song in South Pacific. Some enchanted evening. <laughs> but you'd come out, you know, and you rehearse these, and you're paying a guy 20 bucks, you bring your own piano, but you had to give him maybe 10 bucks, because he used to play with one hand. And uh, <laughs> you give the guy 10 bucks, and you see an empty theater, except somewhere in the row you, back there, you knew there were a lot of heads. And you come out, and they say, what's your name? Merv Griffin. OK, Merv, sing your opener. What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in. Have you got a ballad, Merv? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he sings some enchanted evening. Next. <laughs> and you go, oh. Yeah, it's murderous. But there was one lady on Broadway who got him. And she used to do the world's worst audition, but they couldn't stop it. That's a law of equity that everybody has to be auditioned. She showed up. Well, they were doing a show here called Say Darling. And in the show, there was a scene where the Broadway producer auditioned people. So they said, what an idea. Get her. Sign her for the show. And they went up to her and they said, you have the part. And the lady said, what? They said, you have the part. She said, oh, no, I don't. I never take a part, I only audition. <laughs> and turned them down. Are Don't you, you love it? That's God. a true story. <laughs> Just spent your life auditioning? I know, she finally got the part and said, uh, 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 I only audition, I love her. What do they think they were? Yeah, we'll come back. <laughs> Dr. Channing, Ethel Merman. <laughs> Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Delta Airlines now flies to London, Frankfurt, and over 90 other cities in the U.S. and abroad. Delta is ready when you are. In introducing Stocker Channing, I told you that she's appearing in uh, one of the big hit musicals right now on Broadway called They're Playing Our Song by Marvin Hamlish and Carol Bear Sager. Um, the show is almost autobiographical in a sense almost the story of yes it's written by neil simon and uh, about them right especially. their love affair and yes, then they, they wrote the words and downs, <laughs> yes then they split up yeah now they're not going <laughs> together but the show is still open which is really interesting yeah. the um it's at the imperial theater uh, you're gonna do we need to set up what is the what's happened around oh, this song this you're going to do this particular song for us? takes place um when um 
Vernon and Sonia have uh, split up because Vernon says that he can't take it any longer, in effect, which has happened to all of us, I suppose. And, uh, and she's in the recording studio, and she has to sing the song that they have written together, and it's called I Still Believe in Love. And uh, it's a little ironic that she's singing it after she's just split up with him. He has walked out on her, in effect. Right. Stuck a chatty. Mm -hmm. From there, playing our song. from a big hit Broadway show. We'll come back. Years ago, one of the greatest musicals in the history of American theater made its debut on Broadway. Now that wonderful music of Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein can again be heard in the hit Broadway revival at the Palace Theater, classic Oklahoma. This stunning performance has been captured on this RCA album, We've now we've invited four of the cast to perform for us today. And the first segment here features two of the stars, Lawrence Guitard and Christine Andreas. Here are excerpts from the big hit musical, Oklahoma. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what Cattle 
like statues. All the cattle are standing like statues. They don't turn their heads as they see me ride by. But a little brown maverick is winking her eye. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful a tree and an old weeping willer is laughing at me oh what a beautiful morning oh what a beautiful day i got a beautiful some capers when I was off in Kansas City Mo. I heard some things you couldn't print in papers from fellers who've been talking like they know. I only did the kind of things I ought sort of. To you I was as faithful as can be. Huh. For me, them stories about the way I lost my bloomers. Huh. Rumors, a lot of tempest in a pot of tea. The whole thing don't sound very good to me. Well, you see, I go and sow my last wild oat. I cut out all shenanigans. I save my money, don't gamble, don't drink in the back room down in Flanagan's. I give up lots of other things a gentleman never mentions. But before I give up any more, I want to know your intentions. <laughs> All complete with slippers and pipe. Take me like I am or leave me be. If you can't give me all, give me nothing. And nothing's what you'll get from me. Not even something. Nothing's what you'll get from me. It can't be in between. Uh -uh. It can't be now and then. No half and half romance. Would you build me a house all painted white, cute and clean and pretty and bright? Big enough for two, but not for three. Supposing that we should have a third one. He better look a lot like me. Touch-bitten image. He better look a lot like me. Use waiting up for 
Christine Andreas, right after this commercial break. And of course, now that show stopping duet from Oklahoma with Curly and Laurie, and featuring Lawrence Guitard once again, and now you'll meet Laurie, Christine Andreas. Here they are. Stories that link my name with yours. Why do the neighbors gossip all day behind their doors? I know a way to prove what they say is quite untrue. Here is a gist, a practical list of. claim that you are to blame as much as I. Why do you take the trouble to bake my favorite pie? Grant your wish I carved our initials on that tree. Just keep a slice of all the advice you give. So
Nice. Lawrence Gutag, Christine Andreas, Christine Ebersol, Harry Groner. My, my. That's fabulous. And I don't think any of you, have any of you done Oklahoma before? No. I, no? I have. You have. Ah. <laughs> Several years ago I did it. As Laurie. Yes, an East Coast tour. Right. Mm -hmm. Now there are two San Franciscans here, which makes me proud because I'm a San Mateoan. You are San Francisco, Lawrence. Yes, indeed. Right. And Harry Groner is San Francisco right. here. Uh, and you all have in very good theatrical credits, too. What did you do in San Francisco? Did you do any theatrical performances in San Francisco? Not really. I did most of my work after I left there. Right. I went to Stanford, and I did a lot of work at, at college. Ah, well, that's good. Yeah. And you, uh, you but have you done things, or do you didn't just walk into Curly? No, no, I've been working <laughs> about 10 years. Have I you? was in Night Music and Mount of La Mancha. And My Mount word. Mancha. What about you, Christine? Uh, we have a very famous Andreas, you know. The Falls. The yes. Falls, yes. Not Every time Andreas in California shakes, the whole shakes, the whole state goes, right? <laughs> yeah, we're very powerful. I did uh, My Fair Lady about four years ago, the revival on Broadway, did Eliza right. with Ian Richardson, and before that I had done Angel Street, which Christine and I, Ebersol and I, both shared the same role when I left, she took over. So it's a Christine role, huh? Yeah, I guess I think so, yeah. That must be very tough backstage when they yell, Christine, you're on, and two of you answer, right? <laughs> yeah. Where are you from? I'm from uh, just outside of Chicago, Illinois, Winnetka. Hey, I know Winnetka. Big, no oh, yeah. Big noise from Winnetka, Big sure. Noise from Winnetka, boom, right? boom, I went boom. to New Tier High School with Rock, Rock Hudson and... Um, Different years, though. Yeah, just a little bit, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Had you ever done Ado Annie before? Never. I'd never seen a production of it before. Oh, so, so this is all fresh and new to you. Yeah, uh-huh. Good. And Harry, you got some good things. You got a movie coming out, don't you? Uh, well, yeah, now don't blink, because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I'm in the next um, Robert Redford film called Brubaker, but it's a very, very tiny role. I play the part of a doctor, and it's, I got to leave the show for four weeks during the out-of-town uh, run. We had a tour around the country. Well, you're all terrific, and the audiences are raving, and the Palace Theater is jammed, and it should be. But it's a great cast, the cast of Oklahoma. And we'll be right back. I guess 20 years as a nurse in a New York City hospital. Recently, she was coaxed out of retirement, and now she is a sensation again in concerts, on records, and right here in New York City down in Greenwich Village. Would you welcome one of the great singers of all time at the age of 85, Alberta Hunter. us to have you here. And I'm thrilled. Are you? I, oh, yes. Yeah. I knew eventually I'd be on the show. Oh. <laughs> We've waited 85 years for you. Well, it's 85. I'm here. Yeah. How do you feel? Feel like a million. Do you? <laughs> Never felt better in my life. You look like a million. I really feel fine. You know, I used to say all the time, you know, I've been one of your idols for a long time. I've been following your shows for so many years. Yeah. And I said to myself, eventually I'm going to be on that show. He hasn't asked me yet. Yeah. But eventually, before my 85th birthday is over, I'll be on this show. Isn't and here I am. And here you are. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> Alberta, we are so glad this is not Sunday for taping, because you just will not work on Sunday. Well, you know the truth. Huh. You know, the first time the president invited me to the White House... Was this Carter, not Lincoln? No, but President Carter. Carter. <laughs> president Carter, he invited me to the White House, and I didn't go because it was my Sunday off. My day off, rather. Really? Yeah. You turned down the White House? Turned it down cold. There may be... <laughs> You may get some economic sanctions against you for doing that. I may. This means you'll be out of the Olympics this year, you know. Well, I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of the econo economic sanctions against me already because an income tax, uh, income tax man nearly drove me crazy. Did he get you this year? Oh, he wore me out. Did he? <laughs> they can do that, filling out all those forms, asking all those personal questions. I think it's embarrassing, too. Not so much that. I don't mind that part because I have nothing to tell them of any interest. Yeah. The only thing about it is it took a little change I had made all the year. Yeah, they'll do that to you. But you finally did go to the White House. Oh, yes, I finally went. I've been there three times, you know. <gasps> oh, yeah. Does he go crazy? 
Well, he's not exactly crazy, but I, he enjoyed it a little bit. Yeah. I sang, I laid it on him. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you are mostly known for the blues, but do you have to suffer to sing the blues? No, indeed. Huh? I never suffered. No? I'm, what I'm doing, I'm trying to make the other girls, other people understand what I'm singing to help the other girls out. The other girls are maybe afraid to say that they've had the blues or they don't want to say it. And I'm trying to bring their hearts out to the people. I've never had the blues. I was too slick for that jive. Really? <laughs> Alberta. But I mean, there has, there, there was a man in your early life. Uh, well, I. Did he give you the blues? Never. No. No, indeed. Is I, he still with us? Well, he's still. No, he's still. He's gone. He's gone. Yeah. They called for him. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> not the IRS, just. No, not no, the no, IRS. No. The old master up there he called is. for him. He's right. gone. But Was it know, a good marriage? No, well, I stayed about two weeks. <laughs> well, two weeks of fun. That's not too bad. Where'd he go? What happened to he him? He was a good man. You know, I was making money in Chicago, and the fellas around Chicago asked him why he wanted to go and get a job and make money when he had a uh, wife that was making money. Yes. So I didn't know what his ideas were, and I didn't know whether he was going to let them persuade him to, to change his mind to be in a good mind, instead of being a good mind, to be a bad boy. So every time I'd be getting ready to go home from, from work, Dreamland in Chicago, I would go down to the pier, you know, and get my passport ready. Yeah. And one morning he was looking for me to come home. I was on my way to the harbor. I mean, to the, yes, to get my ship, the La France, to go to Paris. How about that? I went to Paris. So you left him and you took off for Europe, right? Went right on. When you heard from me, I was doing showboat in London. Oh, my. <laughs> Alberta, I don't think we can wait a minute longer. Uh, I'm going to get you all set up here, and when we come back from a commercial break, Alberta is going to sing like you ain't heard any singing in your life. Alberta Hunter, right after this message. <laughs> Five-year-old philosopher, because she's going to tell you what rhythm means to your life right now. The oh. fabulous Alberta Hunter. Voila. Play it, Jimmy. Play it. Play it. Some folks say that rhythm is a sin, but why should they? It was planted beneath most people's skin. They're born that way. When you hear folks say that rhythm is a sin, don't run away. Just stand right up and say, Don't that river Jordan roll to rhythm? Yes, that river Jordan rolls to rhythm. Without rhythm, how huh, that Jordan roll play it? Hey, all God's children got rhythm. Yes, every child of God's got rhythm. He planted rhythm in everybody's soul. I said, now when you get green passages, you can dance all around green passages. Don't that train to glory roll? How you gonna reach your goal? Hey. I said I never want to spill the most. That's it, gold. Hey, without rhythm, I'm not that joy will go. Hey. Yes, all God's children got rhythm. I said every child of God got rhythm. He got rhythm in everybody's soul. I said now, when. Don't that train to glory roll to rhythm? Yes, it goes. Well, I'd rather one more. You're gonna read. I said that river Jordan rolls to rhythm. Yes, that river Jordan rolls to rhythm. Ah, well, I'd rather have that Jordan roll. Yes, every child of God's got rhythm. 
to witness now here in our theater the stirring moment in the big hit musical Avita, where Avita Perone sings to her nation about her her life and her sadness and it's done impeccably by a gifted artist a great voice and a lovely actress uh, as she stars in Avita each night would you welcome patty lapone
myself too much. There's nothing more I can think of to say to you. But all you have to do is look at me to know that every surrounded with a lot of pretty hair here all day today. <laughs> Lots of it. Can I point something out personally to you? I noticed it today when you came in and rehearsed, and I was way up in the back of the auditorium. Applause makes you very happy. When you sang today in rehearsal, all the technicians, everybody who works here applauded for you, and you laughed. Yeah. And right now, when the audience gave you that resounding reception, <laughs> you laughed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not used to applause all your life, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I laughed this afternoon because I thought it was funny that they were applauding. Not that They I, don't always not that applaud. I, oh, oh. I rehearse I thought it was a here rehearsal. a lot. And, uh, <laughs> but when you hear and see in our theater what is a very moving performance in another theater, they know. Well, applause is, I, is this actor's barometer yeah. as how well I did um, because it's... I, my performance is for the audience. Right. They, they paid their money. It's their entertainment. They did and they pay let their me know. money here today? Well, you know. Are you they know. keeping something from me? <laughs> you know, when, when, you're, when, when, you're on your, when I'm on the stage, um, at the end of the show, it's, that's the barometer for me as to how well I did, uh, how, uh, if I've reached them. Uh, because it's I heard your applause for last the audience. Saturday night. And I never heard anything well, it, like the, show, the applause. The, the show gets oh, it. The show. It's the most stunning show. Mm. I mean, it really is. Uh, Thank you. Breathtaking. It's, it's quite and you're terrific. Yeah. And, Thank uh, you. And all of your <laughs> co stars and workers yes, there. It's an excellent show. The cast is it, it's been pointed out, though, that the singers who have played Evita have not had the good vocal luck that you have had. It's evidently been uh, uh, devastating to a lot of singers who have done it on the road and in yes. other countries. Yes, and it was devastating to me too, and I approached someone in the company. Uh, his name is David Bosberg, and he's a tenor. And uh, it's because it's a rangy score. It just shoots up and down uh, uh, each note, just up and down from a D to a high E. And if, if you haven't got a solid technique, you can... I did, I lost my voice on the road. You know, how do you, you, you sing in the show and you're down mm -hmm. at... Lamouche playing it in a nightclub well, at that's, night. Well, that's different because that's sort of, I, my, my social life is incredibly restricted in order to go on six nights a week. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's tough, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but that's the last uh, vestige of energy. I go down on Saturday, because I have Sunday off. Yeah. So I go down Saturday night. And I sing my little heart out. I get all the energy off. Yeah, but you've also been singing the national anthem at the Rangers. Yeah. At the Rangers. <laughs> they won. Yeah. They won. <laughs> they, won. They, won. they won. They won. And they're playing tonight. Yeah, and who is it? Come tonight. on, confess. Is it Duguay? It's what Duguay. Huh? It's what Duguay. It's what Duguay. Yeah, the big star. No, guy. it's the team. It's the team. Oh, it's the team. It's the Ranger team. The whole team, huh, Patty? The whole team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there a girl in this town that isn't after Duguay down there? He even plays without a helmet, so... And all the well, guys protect him so he won't get his face hurt. <laughs> okay? A lot of them play without helmets. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now I think there's a rule now that you have to play with a helmet if you're in coming into the league. But uh, some of the best skaters and some of the best hockey players, Guy Lafleur of the Montreal Canadian, Canadians, he doesn't wear a helmet. 
And uh, he looks beautiful without his helmet. You know Helen looks silly with her helmet. You know your hockey, don't you? I like hockey, yeah. You're liable to get voted Miss Puck of the Year, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That'd be fun. What'd you find out about Evita Perot? You must have done incredible research before you ever approached the part. Yes, I am. Um, you like her or you hate her? No, well, see, now, my view of Eva Perón is strictly theatrical. Right. I have to perform within the framework of the text. That's my only responsibility. I don't have to write a, a thesis on the woman or I, I'm, I'm not into politics. And because I have to play her every night, I have to like her. Because if I didn't like her, the audience wouldn't like her and right. it would be two hours of boredom. But the battle is eternal. I mean, you can talk mm -hmm. to Argentinians today and they will say she is the greatest exactly. woman the world exactly. has ever known. Others will say she was a demon. Exactly. So I can't portray, um, I, I, I try to walk the line because it's clear in the text. She, for 80% of the, the, the two hours, they says that she was a terrible woman. What I try to do is present a woman in a given situation and how she accomplished what she accomplished. Yeah. And the text supplies me with, with, uh, uh, with the nastiness of the woman when she strips the aristocracy and the actress hasn't learned the lines in the second act. She strips the aristocracy and they are now one of the poor, or many of the poor. Um, I, don't, I don't have to do anything else except just be responsible to what they've written. I don't think Eva Perón was an evil woman. I don't think that we are born evil. I think that the woman accomplished uh, a great deal in a period when women could not. I mean, and, and especially in a country that, that uh, in, invented the word macho. Right. There, the uh, Argentinian government up to that point had been run by the military. It was still being run by the military when she was in power because Juan Perón was a general. But Evita was as powerful as Juan. And what she did was she aligned herself with the working class, which was the first time that the working class of Argentina had a voice in their government. So she alienated the two factors that had run her country to that point, the aristocracy and the military. Now, she may have been more ruthless than the military. Um, and she was called Juan's hatchet woman. Okay. She did remove people when they got in the way. But I, what I don't think she did is change the politics of the country. I think she simply learned the game and played the game the way it was being played. Um, everything I've read about Eva Perón, they say the exact same thing. All the books that were written before Evita came out, that she was a fascist whore, a Nazi bitch. Right. They all say that. But that's somebody's impression. And then when Eva Perón wrote about herself, she didn't write about herself. She wrote about Perón and it's a book on Perón's propaganda called uh, La Razón de Mi Vida, I believe, but it's the title that's been re-released as Evita by Evita. She does not defend herself. She simply says, I am this way because of Perón. And, and now people are coming out with books that are saying, well, you know, she didn't do so badly, this, that, and the there other There are thing. still orphanages, hospitals, everything down there with her name. Actually, a lot of it, it was destroyed. A lot of it was the, the children's village she built for... Um, I sound as though I'm, I'm pro Eva, um, and I am to the extent that I must play her every night. I'm, I don't know anything about politics at all. But she built a, a tiny village for, for children that didn't have anything. And then when she died and Peron was thrown out of power, the new, the, government, the new government destroyed that little village for children. So, I mean, you know, what's the diff? You know, the government came in and they, 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 they did the exact same thing Eva was doing. I think that. Now I'm going to get hate mail. Right? No. Well, I don't know. See, I... But what we'll get is that continuing brilliant oh. performance. You're wonderful oh, in it. Thank you. And I have to get you to the theater right now because you have a curtain. Yeah, I do. So thank you, Amelia. Thank you. Patty LaPalme, Evita. <laughs> consideration paid for by the following. I'm proud to say this lady is a dear, dear friend of mine and has been for a long time. She is a wonderfully witty and a wise actress. Currently thrilling New York audiences with her one-woman show entitled Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein, and I see it has been recorded for posterity in this album. But she's here right now. Here's Pat Carroll. <laughs> Oh, I love you. 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 Oh,
Lord, you look like the angel Gabriel. No, darling, I'm a great lady at St. Vincent. Are you? <laughs> How are you, Mark? Well, I'm I terrific. haven't seen you in a couple of years. What have you been doing? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no shows. No. no. I've been on vacation for two God years. Look at you. And look what you've been doing. Isn't for how it long wonderful? now? Well, it will be a year, June sixth. It's the longest I've ever run in anything, right. Merv. I am so grateful. But it's... not exhausted. Oh, not exhausted. Happy, it feeds grateful. you back. It yeah. feeds you back. I've never done a one-person show before, and the fascinating thing is. Our director, Milton Moss, said to me something while we were rehearsing. Yeah. I said, Milton, I've never done this. I've worked in saloons, you know, where you stand up and you perform and you do a song. But I said, what, what do I do about other actors? I might miss them. He said, the audience is the other actor. And I want to tell you, those audiences are doing hell of a performance out there every night. <laughs> They're marvelous. I've been telling Miss Miller that for years. I said, well, she's her own show. She does right. her own woman. Sure. <laughs> yes, Miss Miller does. Yeah. But it's an exciting thing. And you're where... living back in New York, right? You yes. Know? I never knew if I approved personally of you moving to California. Why? Well, I never thought of you in California terms. See, my association with you... thought of me you... more like an avocado tree. No, I oh, never yeah. did. I always thought of you as New York. Because that's when Isn't I... Isn't that funny? I always thought of you as New Jersey. Oh, yeah? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's right. And don't think for a minute I don't still have my farm in New Jersey. I was Jersey. going to ask you. Yay! Yeah. Are those those people that owe me money? <laughs> <laughs> you Listen, what bet. Do you think of this beautiful theater, isn't it? Vivian oh, Beaumont. Is this Beaumont the perfect isn't theater it? in the world? Yeah. Is it marvelous? You're going to take it away with you back? Yes, to California? it's going back. We just fold it up, and away it goes. What do you think about the reception of the audiences here in New York? You miss that, don't no, you? Gee, you miss that, that is huh? Exciting. Aren't they marvelous? The audiences. Do you know that? Here? Yeah. Do you know what I do? I record every night their opening applause and take it back to California, play it around the house. <laughs> when I get up in the morning, I press on the New York audience. Hey! And I get up out of bed. And May I have orange juice, person. please? Hey! <laughs> I could do another track for you. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> don't want to do that, don't you? Do we used to get in trouble all the oh, time. Oh, we used to have fights. Trouble. Oh, we used to put them on. But it's but a new me. It's a new me. Is it I'm a new me, new me? Yeah. yeah. Where are you I living here? I don't ride motorcycles anymore, do any Have you given that up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, now what about I'm on the roller skates? skates? <laughs> about roller skates? <laughs> Where are you living, Pat? I live down in the village because the well, theater, uh, the Provincetown Playhouse, a is down in village person. Grid. Yes, I am a village person. I'm would you like to get with the village people? This would look terrific with them. I wear it every day. This is my regular garb. I didn't come here dressed. Are you kidding? With the pearls? For Merv Griffin, I dress. <laughs> with the pearls? You have to be kidding. The can you, pearls? Can you do Are you the kidding? Thing I eat swinging? these. Sure, I can. can you? Let's see you do it. You're going to get it. I, now, I must say, I stole this from Mistress Beatrice Lilly. Who, did, who was the, who was the master of the, the old birds. pearls? Look. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> now, just a minute. I'll pick that You don't have to help. All Mark. right. <laughs> Little grab here and there. Huh? Are you doing it? Just a minute. All right. Don't get pushy. <laughs> Something very surprising happened in the back. In the back. Yeah. Isn't that all right? Yeah. It's kind of like a parachute from a 747, isn't it? <laughs> Merv, undo me back there. Yeah, I don't know strong. what to do, though. Watch it, Merv. Wait a minute. But you're <laughs> I think sitting I'm in on love. what I have to pull out. Oh, well, then Move let me forward. There it is. Okay. God bless America. Right, now, now we do. <laughs> Better, folks? Huh? Better? Right. Keep the boot. There's... Wait a minute, I did it wrong. Hail Mary, full of grace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We'll be right back <laughs> after this message. <laughs> is just telling Pat Carroll as she was down there to see the show. Yes. Yeah. But you've had exciting guests in that audience, Oh, well, besides, I didn't know you were there, Madeline. I'm well, sorry. I wish well, you'd come back. Well, I slipped in with friends. Not... I admire you very oh, much as an actress, and I would have loved to have seen you. But last Friday night, Sir Alec Guinness came. And this was after the Academy. Now, I have adored Sir Alec Guinness since the 50s, when all of those divine films... I've never missed, missed one movie oh, he's ever made. he's such an extraordinary actor. And he came to see the show with that handsome English director, Peter Glenville, who looks like the young Olivier. I mean, he's gorgeous. And Sir Alec came backstage, and I was really, I was kind of palpitating of the heart. I was yeah, very nervous. Yeah. 
And he said, my dear, I must. I said, Sir Alec, I want to congratulate you for the wonderful. He said, please don't congratulate me. I want to congratulate. Well, we stood there for five minutes. I said, congratulate. Let me congratulate. No, 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 no I'll, I'll congratulate, congratulate you. No, you'll congratulate. He was so fine. I finally said, Sir Alec, do you think that this would run in London? Would it do well? He said, Oh, don't be damn silly. You know it would. He's so wonderful because he cuts all the baloney. You know. He yeah, says, yeah. Don't do that. Don't ask for more compliments. Yeah. Just do it straight out. Wonderful man. I so you're going to take it to Europe, aren't you? We're going to go to London. We're going to go. You're going to go. Will we meet there? Of course. Will we have fish and chips fish and all and that? Fish and chips, everything together. All right, darling. We'll, right. Bro we'll broaden our A's. Right, right. Mine is broadened already. You'll just have to work. <laughs> But I think we're going there next summer for two or three months, probably July and August, and then I think we're doing all the festivals in Europe. Other celebrated folk who've been in that audience to see you down there? Uh, Catherine Hepburn was there our opening night at Provincetown, and the audience was not watching the show. They were watching Miss Hepburn. Everything she did. That's was a like problem. Yes. When you yes. have a celebrity, when you, have a celebrity, yeah, when you yeah. come to see it, wear a long wig. No, no, I'm going to stand then, up through the entire show so that you'll think you're having a standing ovation through the entire thing. I will stand in the middle. That's so good of you. I'm going to give you such a hit, Murph, <laughs> and you <laughs> wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. You've given it. us one hit all oh, over. God bless you. What is the humor of Gertrude Stein? Well, you know, is, that's one of the things I think a lot of people have been fighting not to come see the show because. Most people, we made a survey at the theater. Uh, only 85% of the people who come to the theater know anything about Gertrude Stein or have ever read anything of hers. But I knew this in the beginning. I selected the lady because I thought her life was vibrant. There are many actresses who do readings right. for Miss Stein's work. She was an experimental American writer who lived in Paris for many years as an expatriate. But I think her life was the creative thing. And in discussing it with the young playwright, Marty Martin, who I think has done a beautiful script, uh, we said, let's never assume that anyone comes to the theater knowing a thing about Gertrude Stein. Nothing about her writings, nothing about her life. Let's just tell this story about this woman that we think was indomitable, who had courage, who stuck with her guns and achieved no success till she was 58 mm -hmm. years old. I mean, it was like Alberta Hunter here. You know this marvelous woman of 85 years who comes out here with the vitality of all the worlds. Gertrude Stein was like that. She had vitality. She had the, the force of life. Young people loved her because in 34, when she came here on a lecture and college tour, a lot of the young people were quoted as saying, she turned their minds around, not because of what she said, as because of that magnificent life force in her. Right, right. And I think that's what Marty Martin and I have tried to get at in the play. And I, I Give us some examples of her wit. Well, uh, one example What'd you of, say about of her Oakland, wit. California? Well, that marvelous quote about Oakland after she visited there in third, well, that's where she'd grown up. She said, there is no there there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could say that about Bayonne, New Jersey. Now, don't get sensitive. All right. <laughs> But when she was here in 34, and one of the people who were interviewing her, and she, was, she spoke wonderfully well, you know. A lot of her writing might have been repetitive, but this was the experimental phase in which she was involved. So she was parodied here in America, by, and most people would know her as a from rose, A Rose is a Rose, rose is a rose. rose. So she was mocked and parodied. But when she came here and was interviewed, this one reporter was so taken with her charm and her vitality, and he said, Miss Stein, why don't you write the way you speak? And she said, young man, why don't you read the way I write? <laughs> huh? Kazumbi, the old lady knew where she was at. <laughs> but her entire life was built on truth, reality. And I think that's what we've tried to do in the play, and I think it would be up to Madeline, because I can't describe the play, Mark. I do it every night. I can't describe it. Because what happens in it is a connective between the audience and this character of Gertrude Stein. And as Patti Lapone said about Evita, I have no convictions, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a pedant, about Miss Stein's work as an author. I have tremendous conviction about the courage of her life, so that's what I think about every night, this wonderful courage of this human being who lived on this planet Earth and who gave forth this marvelous vitality, this tremendous feeling, and the young people who come to the theater come back and their eyes are sparkling because our young people today don't have any heroes. They don't have any heroines. They don't have anybody to look up to, to say, yeah, that's the way it should be. That's the way life should be. It's all down. Everything's down and negative. So it's down, make it come up. Yeah. Don't just sit there and wallow in it. And I think Gertrude Stein was like that. She never let any of the hurdles get in the way. She went over them, she went around them, or she went through them. Good. But she was indomitable, and I think that's what we all need today. And don't miss Pat Carroll and Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein. Provincetown Playhouse, Greenwich Village. Have to get you to the theater right now. Right now. Pat Carroll. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Alberta Hunter will sing for you. I told the audience at the top of the show, I mean, 85 now, and it was 74 years ago that you ran away to Chicago? 
Oh, yeah. Well, you were 11 years old. Oh, no, I was eight years old when I ran away from home. But when I got to Chicago and started singing, that my first song was I was about 11 years old. What was life like? It was all right. Mm -hmm. Well, t I tell you, a lot of people I don't know. Uh -huh. The place that I first sang in was a place called Dago Franks. Uh -huh. And it, it was a place that, uh, where the white prostitutes and their pimps hung out. Uh -huh. A lot of y'all don't know anything about that. No, 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 no. <laughs> One of those really and classy that, joints. Yeah, but listen, but we need, you know, we, 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 sh we should feel sorry for those people because nobody knows what causes those girls and boys to do wrong. You don't know circumstances. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. yeah. But did and you they, learn to sing there? I mean, were they a great audience? And well, yes, what a, I knew. I learned two songs. Were they sitting down when you sang? Well, they listened to me. They, yeah. yeah. One song was all night long, and the other one was where the River Shannon flows. I had learned them off an old player piano that you had Gee. to pump with your feet, you know? Yeah. And I sang those songs, and they were so nice. They'd make the fellas give me money all the time. Mm. And then they'd go out and buy me little dresses, because I was only about 11 years old, you know, when I started singing. But you knew what business they were in? No. Oh. I really didn't. I was too young. I knew nothing about that. You then went uh, later on to Paris, became one of the great stars in Paris, the Follies, wonderful shows there, and then retired and became a nurse. Well, I went to Paris, Turkey, Greece, uh, Jerusalem. Oh, what a place. And that's something. I, we did our show from oh, Jerusalem. Oh, my God, what a place, isn't it? something, yeah. Ooh, I went all over the world, ladies and gentlemen. And then uh, I, my mother died. And I wanted to do something for humanity. I thought I'll do my best to serve humanity. So I went to the nursing, Harlem YWCA nursing school. And the lady that was there, Mrs. Phyllis Utz, she gave me, uh, I applied for an application to go into nursing. And she took me, I was a little too old, but she said she saw that I, would, that I was anxious to do something good. So she gave me a chance. And I went to school and I affiliated at uh, the Harlem Hospital and the Goldwater Memorial Hospital on Welfare Island. You still go back and visit, friends? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. I was over there Monday. Yeah. Oh, sure. But I it's go. the cookery where they've been jamming in to see you. Oh, it? you're uh, telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels good to be back in showbiz. Yes, it? it does. I'm yes. very happy. You know, I went to Bobby Short's party and a fellow there named Charlie Bourgeois, he was there. Charlie Bourgeois? Yeah, Charlie Bourgeois. He, you know, he has... Uh, I he's, like his name. He's hey. associated with the uh, uh, jazz, you know. Yeah. And he um, said, why don't you come back into show business? Well, they finally persuaded me to come back, and I went to talk. Barney Josephson called me and said, come down, talk to me. Well, after having talked with uh, Barney Josephson for, for about three minutes, I was uh, really certain that I wanted to go back into show business because he's such a fine, honest man. I don't have a contract with him. I've been there three years. Wow. And from the day I opened to the day I closed, they had to get extra chairs. God is good. <laughs> Alberta, sing for us. All what right. do you want to do, about working man? Yeah. Yeah. Here's Alberta Hunter to sing for you right now. A lot of these chicks are crying murder. I don't have to move my hand Yes, these glamour girls are crying hard luck But I don't have to move my hand I've got myself a little apartment Dog and a cat and a working man He'd never win no beauty contest and goodness knows he don't dress fine he looks like dracula he'd never win no beauty contest and goodness knows he don't dress fine ah but he's healthy and ambitious and he lays it on the line now i don't want no hipster lover i'm too slick for that jive They've got larceny in their eyes. No, I don't want no hipster lover. They've got larceny in their eyes. They've got a hand full of gimme and a mouth full of much obliged. <laughs> now 
Now you glamour girls can stop crying inflation if you just adopt my plan. It's a whopping good one. <laughs> yeah, you glamour chicks can stop crying inflation if you just adopt my plan. Stop letting these pretty boys jive you. Get yourself a working man. Some people see us out together, they just laugh and turn away. Yeah, when some folks see us out together, they look at us and laugh and turn away. Ah, but the joke is on them, baby, because I'm eating three square meals every day. kind of old and very thin. He's emaciated. <laughs> no, he's not a bit good looking. He's kind of old and very thin. Ah, but there are plenty good tunes, honey, left in an old violin. <laughs> The great Alberta Hunter. You tore it up here, Alberta. Chaz comes to Lincoln Center. Thank you, Alberta. Oh, it's my pleasure. We'll be right back after this message. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's really. Our next Meridian Award winner is uh, in the midst of a spectacular career. She's been a smash hit in uh, every medium. She's attempted from Broadway to films to concert halls and theaters all over the world to recordings. She is one of our most gifted performers and I'm delighted to welcome her as one of this year's Meridian Award recipients. New Yorkers especially love her because it was she who introduced this famous song about New York that everybody has sung. And she sings it with such her interpretation is perfect because she sings it with all the vulnerability of someone who really wants to make it in this great big town. And she, here she is at work singing New York, New York from her picture, Liza Minnelli. Watch this clip first. First, let me say how cute you look. Thank you, Murphy. You look great, Liza. Thanks so much. And I know how hard you've been working. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Thank you very much. May I, may I uh, say this? If I'm correct, you introduced that song on our show just as the movie came out. Right. For the first time. And we were so stunned, <laughs> we all just sat there and stared, knowing that we were hearing something that was going to just... Yeah. sweep the country. I remember the first time that I heard that 
Fred Ebb and John Cantor played it for me. And I just fell down. I thought it was so wonderful. I, just, I thought, oh my goodness. Just let me get my hands on it. song for, for New York, for the energy of it. Not only for New York, but for, for America. I mean, it, was, it had all of that, the right energies going. Right. You know, that positive attitude. Talk about achievement, Liza. I look at you, because I was really there from the very beginning. We did our first interview <laughs> ever together on uh, what was it called, Hollywood Talent Scouts. I know. Do you remember we were both so nervous, our mouths were going, you know that terrible thing when you smile? And right. you're just going, what <laughs> We're trying to smile, our cheeks are going like yeah. <laughs> Then we went off to England, we did a special together. Right. Over there? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you take me the rest of the time on the road with you? Well, I'm available. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> and I love you. You've done it. You've won the Oscar, the Tony, the, um, I don't want to leave anything out here, the Oscar, the Tony, um, the Emmy, um, uh, the Merv Award, uh, and now the Meridian. You've achieved it all. Is there something more you want to achieve? I would like to just keep getting better. Yeah, well, that's... You know, there's so... so much to learn, and there's so many things to see, and there's such things to strive for besides, you know, peace of mind, and which is the most important thing, because that allows you to do everything else. It kind of clears the way for you to get involved in the things that you love. And uh, I, I just like to to really uh, learn to appreciate my life every single day, because it's so fragile. Are there any new places that you look forward to playing that oh, you haven't? Oh, sure. Any place I haven't been, I look forward to. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been to all the places. I've seen you in Europe. I've heard them stand and scream here in America, everywhere. Yes, they stand differently in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you look forward? You're going to be playing in Paris. Yes, I'm In so a excited. very unusual place. Mm -hmm. Well, Le Moulin nice. Rouge. Yes. I think that's so wonderful. I think it's a great idea. You know, I remember, because, you know, growing up in Hollywood, you, your whole reference to life is kind of, you know, films. Yeah. You know, that's how you learn history, you know, and you learn all sorts of things from watching the movies. And the movie, The Moulin Rouge, was so wonderful. Do you remember it? Oh, very well. And Plus, when you get into the Belle Epoque and you start studying all that stuff, and it's just fabulous. I can't wait to go there. Right. The That'll rafters be... must be ringing with all right. that talent. That'll be very special. And then what else? More films? And, uh... Um, yes. That's next year. Right. But for now, I'm, I'm really trying to make it right for where I'm going, this particular concert, you know. Are you leaving a little hunk of your life oh. for you? Liza? Oh, yes. Are you? I think what happens is that I never do any interviews or anything when I'm not working. So, people think that I just work, because I'm so private when I, I don't work. You know what I mean? I like to keep my life for myself and for my dear husband. Where, where is your home? In New York. It is New York. Yes. Right. <laughs> we hear more and more, and, and, and see it on, on shows like this, of great artists like yourself, who have had enormous ups and downs and yes. tragedies in their life, and yet they seem to feel, though, that it makes them even a better performer. Is that necessary? I think so. I think that you have to know all about all sorts of emotions in order to portray them properly, you know? Right. And uh, the more sensitive you are, like I, I was watching downstairs in the green room, I was watching Lee Volman speak with you, and she was so beautiful, and everything she said was so simple and funny and sweet. I mean, that, that lady's got a lot going on inside of her, that, and she's, there's a purity to her. She stays open to things, right. and you have to if you're going to portray a role. You just have to be a big sponge right. with life, you know, and take in everything that comes so that you can uh, translate it properly in your work. And I see you doing more and more benefits. That's obviously a personal desire to put something back in Absolutely, to yes. the world. Yes. Great. It's nice to have that time. Right. I just spent a whole year off. <laughs> Did you I really? Said, Did you go crazy? <laughs> Did you sing in the shower? No, I, was, I had the best time. It worried me to death. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't work and I thought, oh, I'm going to go nuts in two weeks and I'll be antsy and want to But do you something. must walk around the house going, mm-hmm, to make sure it's still there. No, I knew it was there. <laughs> I was lucky. I mean, 
I just didn't want to abuse it, you know. Right. And I found out that this, you know, it was like going back and uh, doing your homework on real life <laughs> instead right. of your your business, which is fantasy in, in the, this case, in my case. So the year was off, and now is it going to be a year of work? Oh, well now I had, yes, now we go into fourth gear again. Right. So it's Paris, and where it's, else? It's Rome. It's, uh, we're going a lot of places in Italy, in Italy, excuse me, and I've never performed in Italy before. And I'm a little bit nervous because I, I can speak French, but I can't speak Italian. And um, I'm a little embarrassed about it, so I was thinking of going to Berlitz in between rehearsals and <laughs> you know, quickly getting a crash course. Sure. I, I, I think no matter what language you sing in, those people will do what everybody else does in the world, just fall down, Liza. Thanks, I'm a great Mark. fan. These are all fans sitting well, here. Thank you so much. You are a great achiever. The Meridian Award. Thanks. With all of our congratulations. Thanks. And continued success. Liza Minnell. Thank you. something. We'll be right back after this message. Robinson's spectacular sofa sale is happening now. You'll save 20 to 40 percent on our entire collection of over 2,000 sofas and sleep sofas, beginning at just $499. Available in your choice of over 1,200 fabric style combinations. With your Robinson's charge, there are no payments until May 1983. Save 20 to 40 percent.